As an 18-year-old first-year university student, I soon encountered something in the big city that this small-town farm boy had never seen before. I was getting on a bus in the rough part of town, and some people were huddled in a corner doing something like this. Now, it wasn't winter. They weren't cold. So I asked someone, what's going on there? And the response that came was, well, they're sniffing. Now, the proper term for what was happening is solvent abuse, but no one on the street calls it solvent abuse. No, the crew that we had encountered were well known in the area as the sniffers. Sniffing involves taking some glue or some paint thinner and maybe some gasoline and putting it on a rag and just breathing deeply. Now, I remember that my initial reaction to this was something akin to shock. Why? Why would you do that? Doesn't it mess you up physically? Doesn't it kill brain cells? What's going on here? Why would you do that to yourself? Over the next 20 years, working in education and community development, a good portion of my life became about trying to find an answer to that question. Why would you sniff glue? Why would you do that to yourself? I think the answer has something to do with something I would call symptoms of hopelessness. Symptoms of hopelessness. And much of my own learning came about because of a peculiar friendship that formed with a guy that I will call Mike. Now, as I said, I was a university student in the Faculty of Education, and members of my friend group were unsure about how to respond to people approaching us on the street and asking for money. We didn't know what the right answer was in that situation. To this day, I'm not sure that there is one. But we knew what the wrong answer was. To get fearful and withdraw and ignore the situation and the people in it. So we agreed that when someone approached us asking for money, we wouldn't give money, but we would offer to take them for a burger. Now the shocking thing to me initially was just how many people weren't interested in that burger. I thought everyone would want to have a burger with me. <laughs> but interestingly enough, the people who tended to say yes to our burger offer were those ones known as the sniffers. And that led to some interesting social pairings. It's not every day that a farm boy from the sticks ends up across the table from someone who's homeless and addicted to sniffing glue. But that's what happened. Now, I definitely undertook this as a sort of a project. I was going to help. Maybe I was going to fix. I'm sure some today would have accused me of having had a white savior complex, and they might not have been that far off. I don't think I did very much saving, though. Now, 20 years later, Mike and I are still friends, and I doubt he would say I fixed him very much. But the honest truth is that my friendship with Mike completely changed me. It's not an exaggeration to say that he altered the trajectory of my own life. Learning is basically about getting closer, understanding something better by seeing it from new angles and seeing how the pieces fit together. That's kind of what happened with, with Mike and I. We spent a lot of time together, which I think allowed us to see each other more clearly. Mike tended to speak really honestly, and so I did the same. I heard all about his life, and soon it wasn't hard to see that for Mike, sniffing was a symptom of hopelessness. Now, a symptom of a cold is a cough or watery eyes, an outward indicator 
that something much deeper is going on. For Mike, sniffing was a symptom of something much deeper. Basically, a life that was characterized by a whole bunch of things going wrong. You might call it a, a stack of failures. The most obvious were his own personal failures. Sometimes Mike would make dumb choices that would lead to bad consequences. Sadly, though, when people are distant from the situation, that can tend to be all they see. Personal responsibility. You failed because you screwed up. Now, that was undeniably partly true, as it is for all of us. It just wasn't the whole story. In fact, sometimes I think we focus on someone's personal failures when we are distant, because the other failures in the stack might be something that we share some responsibility in, or at least that call us to action. So it can be easier to pile it back on the person we are condemning. Your life's a mess, and it's your fault. But in truth, personal failure was only part of the problem. The first log in the stack that Mike was carrying around on his shoulders. The next one you might have called something like family failures. Because Mike didn't grow up in a home where he had parents who were telling him he was awesome and trying to help him be awesome. In fact, his mom kind of communicated that he was garbage because that's what she had been told about herself. It's a big lie. It's maybe the biggest lie. But she had come to believe it. When you hear the big lie enough times, that can happen. You see, Mike didn't grow up in a residential school, but his mom had. Taken from her folks and sent to a place where, for the next 12 years, a central message was, you and your people are bad. What you are about is dark and demonic. You need to not be what you are. You need to be like us. You need to be what we are. She essentially heard the big lie again and again for 12 years during the most impressionable time of her life. So when they sent her home at age 18, was she ready to take on the world and make the most of her potential? No, you can't do that when you think that you are garbage. So you can see how Mike's Family failures were rooted in societal failures and historical failures. Things that happened before Mike was even born ensured that he would not have the same chances that I had. So what happens when you're carrying around a stack of failures? Personal failures, family failures, societal failures, historical failures... Well, they start to weigh you down, and they start to crush you. The worst thing that can happen is that you stop hoping, and maybe even planning for the future. Self-help experts say, live for the moment. Be in the now. But when your now is constantly a miserable one, something like sniffing can start to make more sense. I asked Mike, what does sniffing feel like? Does it feel good? He said, no, it just feels like nothing. It feels like being in a cloud, like fuzziness, like a big zero. But when much of your life is lived feeling like you're at minus 10, the zero can look pretty good. He would hold up the rag and he'd say, this is my holiday. I can't go to Mexico or the mountains or camping at the lake. When I want to get away from it all, this is how I do it. I think it was important for me to understand this problem through a friendship like the one I had with Mike. 
But I know that this story has repeated itself thousands of times throughout our country. And that can feel overwhelming. And that feeling is compounded when you know that throwing money at the problem is no silver bullet. Money can help. Money is a starting place. But the only way, the only real answer to fixing problems like these are heart hours. Do you know what I mean by heart hours? Heart hours are real relationships, real human hearts connecting with real human hearts, making friendships where the effect flows both ways. Sometimes we say, you change them, and they change you, and that changes everything. That's a real relationship where you have something to give, but you also have something to get. Heart hours are expensive, though. That's what makes this such a big ask. Because there are lots of people with millions of dollars, but there is no one with millions of heart hours. Everyone gets the exact same number, 24 in a day. And money you can give from a distance. Not so with heart hours. That kind of giving requires that you close the gap. And that can feel risky because it's your own heart that you're offering. But I can't see any other way of healing the pain that lies at the root of those symptoms of hopelessness. The only way to do that is to counter stacks of failure with nets of success. So I speak in schools for a nonprofit called Silo Mission that deals with homelessness and poverty. And one time I was speaking to a group of students, and a little guy in the front row was giving me a suspicious look that continued on as I gave my talk. Finally, it bugged me enough that I stopped and I said, what? <laughs> what's, that, what's that look on your face all about? And he said to me, you're from Siloam Mission, right? I said, yeah, I'm from Siloam Mission. <laughs> he said, what's the mission? <laughs> He'd been watching too many Tom Cruise movies. <laughs> so I played along. I said, okay, uh -huh. the mission at Siloam Mission is making nets. He said, what? Nets? Hockey nets? Basketball nets? No, no, no. Nets of success. And then we talked about how each of us has a net. These are the people who are connected to us and connected to each other, who are strong for us when we are weak. Because everybody's weak sometimes. And so often, homelessness and poverty are heavily linked to not having that net of relationships to fall into or having one that's just been left in strands. And then it gets a lot harder to deal with your, your weaknesses or even to hide them. When you have money and resources, so often your life can be just as messy. But we sure get a lot better at hiding the mess. So building up these nets of relationally connected people becomes the path to a solution that's long-term and effective because it's not simply about fixing the person who appears to be in the greatest need. It's about fixing us too. Strong communities only really happen when we all have the grace and the humility to admit that every person is some mixture of strong parts and weak parts. In fact, the worst way to help someone is when you completely ignore this point. It's when you show up and you say, I'm here and I'm pretty close to perfect. <laughs> and you are a mess and I'm here to fix you. Congratulations. <laughs> but the lie that's hiding in there is that no one is pretty close to perfect. Every person, every family, every community, every culture is some mixture of strong parts and weak parts. And the best thing, the beautiful thing about connecting with someone who's different than you is that you get strong parts that you didn't already have. 
because no one has all the strong parts just on their own. Even Mike. Now, lots of people would look at Mike's life situation and say, yeah, but come on. This guy is all weaknesses. But that's precisely where I got so lucky. Because Mike had strengths that you couldn't have seen without getting up close and personal. To this day, when I seek him out, it's not because he needs me, it's because I need him. Nets of success, a meal, a job, a home, but mostly friends. Because the biggest success is when you know that you're loved and you know that you're valuable to somebody. Everybody needs that, whether they sniff or don't. To be known and to be loved, that's success. <laughs> 